All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, uh, people watching. Um, we are talking to four Turkey experts. We're going to talk about the events that happened uh, in Turkey over the weekend, starting on Friday evening. Uh, starting on the left on the order, I'm looking at them on my screen. We have Aaron Stein. Uh, Aaron is at the Atlantic Council. We have Barack Kadirjan, who's at the U.S. Naval War College. We have Joshua Walker, who is at the German Marshall Fund. We have Salim Koru. Salim, I'm going to mess up the name of your organization, so you should just probably say it yourself. Uh, the Economic Policy Research Foundation of Turkey, so TEPA. Great. Uh, let me just tweet out that, that we're live. Oh, we got twenty. We got a bunch of people watching already. So, guys, I'd like to ask you all to speak uh, for like about five minutes each on the sort of basics. We all know what happened. We all know there was a coup attempt. We all know it failed. We all know that it was a, seems that it was a part of the army uh, and definitely not the entire military. But there's a lot we still don't know. So maybe Aaron and I can talk with, start with you. Yeah, and, and I'd like to defer to Salim, you know, on, on sort of what it was like to actually be in country at the time, because I think the three, the, three other, the four of us who were also in addition on the call weren't actually there at the time, but were following it live on Twitter, although I'm making some assumptions there. Uh, I challenge a little bit of the prevailing narrative that's come out since, I would say, Friday night here on the, on the East Coast and then Saturday morning in Turkey, is that this was sort of a, a bumbling coup plot where sort of a group of officers operating out of the chain of command uh, launched a hopeless coup that didn't play out very well. As it was unfolding, and I think as we learn more and more about this, is that the coup attempt, and I, I don't want this to sound like an endorsement of the coup or anything like that because it's not, um, brought together all the right pieces that if you were to do this, uh, you know, were necessary to carry it out the way that they had envisioned. It seems that and the prevailing narrative within the Turkish press is that they had been found out and that they hit fast forward on what was a plot that had been long in the planning. And I would actually emphasize the planning aspect more than anything else. And I'll just go here. Is that the, the, the plotters were able to bring together aircraft from two different air bases, um, uh, Akunja near, uh, near, uh, near Ankara and Injerlik, which hosts the anti-ISIL coalition, uh, as well as aircraft and helicopters and then tanks and armored personnel carriers, all of which to carry out a relatively synchronized, and I would call it somewhat sophisticated application of force relatively quickly. Uh, I think what saved the day is that they were bumbling in their attempts to decapitate the government, and I think that that is where this differs considerably from previous coups uh, in Turkey in that the, the goal seemed to me to either arrest or take control of President Erdogan, uh, if not outright kill him, uh, to target the Prime Minister, to target another entity uh, specifically affiliated with this AKP government, the National Intelligence Service. Uh, and I think we would all be singing a, a largely different tune if some of those synchronized parts had worked out uh, and come together um, more coherently, and you would have had that decapitating strike on leadership. And so when I look back on it, now we have some time to reflect in the 72 hours, I think we were closer to actually a decapitation of leadership than has been, than, than has been put out there. Uh, and I think that's very worrying um, about the state of, let's say, Turkish institutions writ large, but again, just looking at the military, this was a minority, this was a small group of officers that I don't think represents sort of the prevailing uh, wisdom of the Turkish military. But nevertheless, I would call them a sizable minority, and I think that should concern all of us, considering all the NATO implications and the security implications that go with Turkey and its uh, links to the Transatlantic Alliance. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Salim, you were—you know—you live in Ankara. Uh, your office is right across the street from uh, the Presidential Palace, uh, I believe. Uh, what was the? Ex if you could just walk us through the experience of being there while this was happening, and also talk about what's been happening since the coup failed. Well, yeah, so um, I, um, it was a very strange experience, actually. I, I was just sitting at home. Um, I live in Chankaya, which is a relatively affluent neighborhood. I mean, it's, it's, it's about a 20-minute walk away from uh, Kula Park, which is where um, Gezi Park protests happened in Ankara. Um, so, so when I... I mean, we were all hearing jets, and uh, we took to social media. People were exchanging uh, information, 
and at some point it became clear what, when the Prime Minister uh, connected via cell phone uh, to a uh, news network, I think it was also CNN too, um, it became clear that, that it was a coup attempt, that uh, they, were blocking, they were blocking the bridges in Istanbul, and uh, that was a very surreal experience. I, I didn't think that I would experience a coup in my lifetime. Um, and then soon afterwards, I just went out. I, I just wanted to see what happened, what was happening out on the street, and there wasn't anything happening for for. Uh, um, I mean, anywhere where I lived, people were glued to their television screens, for the most part. And I saw tanks. Um, at, at that time, it became very clear that you know, um, this was uh, something very different was happening. I saw tanks um, climbing up Jinnah, which is the the hill that um, that leads to the presidential palace, the old one, uh, the Ataturk's sort of place. Um, and then um, I, I spent most of the night just walking around, seeing some friends. Um, there were there were uh, the sound of jets, the sound of mosques came in. Um, the sound of tech beer cries from uh, the direction of parliament. Um, so it was. Um, I I actually went towards parliament. Um, I I thought of joining the crowd, but um, between me and the crowd, there were there were soldiers. Um, I would have had to pass the soldiers and and walk quite a bit further to get to them. So I um, you know, I didn't relish the thought of dying alone. So. I went back. Could I just um, could I just jump in real quick? What were the um, what were the soldiers doing at this point? Uh, was it and was it at this point was it clear that the coup was not going well for the people that had launched it? And were these soldiers that were involved in launching the coup, or were these soldiers from units that remained loyal to the government? What what exactly was happening? Well, um, it was dark. I saw them from far away, um, but they were clearly armed with with rifles. Um, I didn't know whether they were. That's right, because because uh, I mean they could have been police special forces there to you know counter the coup. Um, I wasn't sure about that. I think they saw me, uh, but they didn't come towards me. I was about a block or so away, uh, U.S. block. And at one point, then I saw uh, an armored personnel carrier uh, loaded, not loaded. The, they were on top of it, uh, a bunch of young very young looking soldiers were on top of it and they drove up uh, the hill where uh, the US Embassy is actually here. Uh, so Ototuk, they, they, they drove it up and they had a Turkish flag on uh, with them. So those guys looked like uh, they were with the coup, they were with the junta. Um, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't go further than that. I, I started going back, there was a hospital, stopped by the hospital, talked to the people there. Um, and at that time, it was becoming clear that uh, the coup was being countered. So uh, President Erdogan had landed in Istanbul. Um, we listened to his, his, his talk there with a bunch of people. And yeah, then I, I actually made it to Parliament in the morning uh, to see who was there and, and what was happening. And you wrote about that in the article that we published over the weekend uh, about the, sure. pro the demonstrations that were going on. Well, one of the things that you touched on was the sort of uh, religious character of a lot of the slogans being shouted uh, both during the demonstrations in the evening but also the next day. Could you talk a bit about that and, and why this might be sort of a, maybe not an unusual but a, a noteworthy thing uh, in the context of Turkish politics? So I think it's significant. I mean, this is of course the coup. I mean, in some ways, the 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 coup plotters are still out there. And there's still security concerns, um, but I think it's significant in the sort of medium to long term of this story that um, who came out to counter the coup. It's going to be significant, um, and it wasn't the the secular liberals. It was the more religious people, and it was working class people. It was people who um, Generally, vote for the AK Party, but also a little more to the right of the general AK Party voter. 
maybe maybe a lot more to the right. So they were, um, for example, you don't really see the Tekbir sign, the the uh, the very it's a heavy Islamist sign in Turkey, the Tekbir sign. In in many Islamic countries, it, it's it's commonplace. In Turkey, if you have people using it in in that sort of political setting, um, that indicates uh, you know certain kind of uh, political dedication that, that is far to the right. Uh, there were a whole lot of Ülkücü, so nationalists, and um, when I got there in the morning at first, overwhelmingly male, I would say 98% or you know, very, very few women were there. Um, and the chants were, you know, they were very aggressive. And, and these people, I mean, I don't blame them. They, they I mean, these people would face down these tanks, they a lot of them had died doing that. Um, they were still sort of in a state of war almost, they, you know, countering the coup. Uh, so there was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of, for example, when the special forces, uh, police special forces came, um, uh, there were lots of chants, there were, you know, these guys were clearly very pleased to, to see the police and uh, there were lots of pro-police slogans. They didn't want to do anti-military slogans, I think. Also, they probably didn't have any, uh, you know, memorized. Uh, but there were certainly many pro-police slogans. Jo Joshua, I know you can't stay with us the whole time, so I'm just going to jump over to you. Um, you know, what's your take on these events, and particularly the U.S. role and what, what we should be doing uh, and how Americans should be understanding what's happening there? You know, I, I like the way Aaron started by basically kind of saying, look, you gotta, we, we've had 72 hours to reflect because those, those who have been following this, as Salim already put it out, uh, you know, people have not been sleeping. This is completely unprecedented in terms of kind of looking at Turkey as the second largest military force in NATO. The, the instability of this coup in some ways, or failed coup, is actually even bigger than an ISIS terrorist attack that we saw three weeks ago at the Istanbul airport, which is hard to say because you would have expected these types of attacks would be far more significant. But I think what's interesting now is the aftermath. Uh, in some ways, this failed coup is actually the worst of all outcome. Of course, it's great that the, 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 the people rose up. I think it really demonstrated the lack of unity there is in Turkey. The fact that uh, the supporters that came out were of uh, the character that, that Salim just laid out, and he laid out beautifully in his article as well. The fact that you had the mosque broadcasting things, a lot of the stories that are coming out now, it's not a black or white situation. It's not kind of everybody who's anti-coup is pro-Erdogan. Just like in the U.S., we have a problem with kind of being able to be pro-cops and pro-Black Lives Matter. We've got a little bit of the same thing going on. Nobody wants to be anti-military. Nobody wants to be pro-coup. And yet what's happening right now is because Erdogan not only survived this coup, it's coming out much stronger than we expected. Uh, what's interesting is the, the U.S. reaction is now becoming one of the largest pieces of this. And given the fact that uh, Fethullah Gulen, enemy number one of the Turkish state, and, and according to Erdogan and all government officials behind this latest attempt, it, it strikes me that this is going to be a major thorn and it's going to drive everything. So regardless of what happened and who was actually behind this, I think that the actual coup plotters who were the biggest storyline on Friday, uh, they're going to in some ways become a little bit irrelevant. And when you're looking at the reaction by the Turkish government, uh, it's going to be, it's interesting to watch how this plays out. And the impact that this has on U.S.-Turkish relations can't be underestimated. And I think, you know, even more so, the way we think about Turkey is traditionally in a transatlantic European context. But this coup really, in some ways, puts Turkey squarely much more in kind of the Eastern or Middle Eastern perspective. And so the fact that there were different reactions on the night of the coup, and some people uh, initially thought this would be a good thing, like you would say in Pakistan or, or Egypt, depending on what your political motivation is, uh, this is clearly a different reaction. If this same coup had played out in any Eastern European country or anything else, I wonder what the reaction would have been. And so picking up the pieces after that uh, will be really interesting. And the fact that John Kerry, the Secretary of State, had to overtly step out and say America had no involvement in this coup is very is very interesting. Well, the Joshua... The government's playing with it is going to be important moving forward. Go ahead, Ryan. Joshua, if I could just jump in. Uh, the, you touched on what Kerry had to say. Could you give the people watching... Uh, and listening a sort of 101 version of the Gulen movement and the U.S. relationship with the Gulen movement and, and uh, you know, what happened between the movement and the government over the last uh, few years. 
Sure. There's no way to describe this without being, being accused of being too subjective one way or the other. So I'm just going to put out what the facts are. Uh, Fethullah Gulen is a Turkish imam or, or, or religious scholar who left Turkey during one of the coups, actually, and sought asylum and has been living in the United States since then. He lives in Pennsylvania, which is why a lot of the, 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 the campaign, a lot of the things that Erdogan and his ministers have been saying has been those who live in Pennsylvania. So when you hear Pennsylvania uh, in this context, it basically is a direct reference to Gulen. Gulen himself is a figurehead of a much larger movement that's called the Hizmet, which means movement in Turkish. Uh, it's a group of kind of faith-based uh, kind of uh, NGO, if you will, uh, that has been doing lots of work around the world, has schools everywhere, including the United States. They used to be very close allies with Erdogan and the AKP because they both came from a conservative uh, Muslim ideology and movement about how to change the world uh, using tolerance and Muslim scholarship. Uh, but two years ago, maybe three years now, it was a major falling out, and the Gulen movement accused the current government uh, of corruption, uh, and, and the Turkish government has ever since then declared uh, the Gulen movement not just enemy of the state but being terrorist. And as we're seeing, it's become this large uh, stick through which Turkey uses anybody that supports the Gulen movement. The U.S. has not taken an official position on the Gulen movement, but Gulen himself has a green card, which means that somebody in the U.S. government uh, allowed him to stay in this country, even if it was a bureaucracy. And so one of the things that's going to come out of this is the Turkish government and Erdogan and, and the Prime Minister Yildirim have made it very clear, if you support Glenn, you can't be a, a friend of the U.S. I think a lot of Americans and Europeans are watching what's playing out and kind of wondering and asking the question, why is Glenn being accused of this, even if there were some who were sympathetic? The military and Glenn have never had any uh, love lost between them. So that's kind of the, the, the 101 in, in that sense. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, the Gulen, Gulen movement was behind a lot of the trials that end, uh, put a lot of uh, Turkish senior military leaders behind bars uh, earlier in the AKP, AKP's rule. And there was a sort of tense, tense uh, several hours at least, where Intralik Air Base, which is an American uh, Air Force base in Turkey, uh, was was basically surrounded and cut off from the world. And Aaron, I'm going to return, bring that up with you again later. But for now, I want to turn to Barack. Barack, you sort of, in a, in a way, called this. You wrote an article for us last year in which you said a coup was, was probable, and it might be led by, it was more likely to be led by mid-ranking officers. And uh, you, you warned of what you called the Turkish winner. And now you say that we are in the Turkish winner. Could you, uh, could you explain what you meant by all that? Sure. Uh, so basically, uh, I, as suggested, I will not comment much on what happened so far. And I agree with Aaron, for example, that it was a close call, especially once you go back and listen to what some of the key leadership, including former President Abdullah Gül, was talking about, how he reacted. I mean, we can see some element of fear and anxiety, obviously. And again, once we look at the military operational uh, planning, execution, this seems like a re the real deal. So I think it was much closer and we sort of think about it. But that, without that, what I think would happen uh, down the road, and I wrote a piece for uh, War on the Rocks uh, today, but before I'm moving ahead, I have to highlight this. Uh, whatever views I you know, present here or elsewhere are my own and do not reflect uh, U.S. Naval War College, Department of Defense, Department of uh, Navy, and United States government. But that being said, I think four things are to be expected down the road. First, the purge. And you may say, well, of course we're expecting a purge, but I would highlight the purge would be very extensive, very deep. There will be no stone left on moot. Uh, I think today will be when uh, the you know, higher education system sort of will be uh, gutted. Now, at, least, at least the process will start today. And I think it will go to all areas of the state and society. So. This will be huge, and I would say down the road, historians will call this the Great Perch or some version of it. So I think the first thing we should expect is a Great Perch. And during this Perch, I expect Erdogan to literally slice and dice uh, the state establishment apparatus and media, education, higher education, business world. So it will be very, very big and it will be extensive. The second thing, again, I, this will be sort of repeating what's already been said, will be the rise of uh, Gulen narrative. So domestically and at the foreign policy stage, we'll see more and more Gulen. I mean, and this will not go away easily. So eventually, the Gulen narrative will drive Erdogan's incentives and efforts to, again, slice and dice and purge uh, the state apparatus. 
and beyond. And a third item that I think needs to be highlighted is what I refer to as absolute presidency in the lines of absolute monarchy, maybe in so many ways, because uh, Erdogan has been pushing for a change in the constitution. As most of you already know, while Erdogan is the president, Turkey is not run on a presidential system, which means the president's office has very limited powers. So Erdogan has been trying to push for a constitutional change that will allow him to become the absolute president in so many ways. And so far he has lost some ground, gained some ground, but he has not been able to make, make the final push. And this coup attempt will eventually help Erdogan to make the push and turn to the people and say, you know what? What do you want? You want a coup and instability, a risk of civil war, or you want a strong president? And this coup decisively gave him that opportunity. I think he will make a push for it. And the months ahead, we'll talk and hear more and more about whether a presidential system is appropriate for Turkey or not. And I think eventually, short of an unforeseen event development, he will get what he wants and we will see uh, Erdogan institutionalizing his sort of you know, absolute presidency. And last thing I will highlight, and already been highlighted, is the impacts of this coup attempt and Erdogan's reactions for the secular conservative or secular Islamist divide in the country, which does not appear in the first place as very striking as other divisions in the country. But in the end, uh, especially given the fact that mosques broadcast it across the country, sort of calls to the streets and prayers, nonstop basis, and some of the protests in the streets took, not all of them, and not entirely took a religious tone, I think will make the seculars in the country feel more and more isolated and alienated and targeted. And I think this will eventually drive the existing divisions in the country between the seculars and, well, AKP's followers or conservatives, whatever you call them, with sort of down the road, dark consequences. And in fact, this is what I've been sort of in the past year writing about the Turkish winter or, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Arab spring, because the, the, I came up with the concept, I thought about the concept when three years ago during Gezi Park protests, some, if not all, spectators were celebrating the Turkish Spring, the lines of Arab Spring. And I think the protests were a symptom of the disease that Turkish democracy has been decaying for quite, so, quite some time. And right now, I think we're seeing the final stages of Turkey moving into a political winter. And one can say, and I would say, it, now we're inside the political winter, which will be marked by multitude of tensions. One would be the obvious Kurdish question, which did not come with Erdogan with not, and will not go away anytime soon. The other would be, again, did not come with Erdogan and will not go soon, go away soon, is the secular versus conservatism as to why. And I think the coup attempt made the divide even more visible. So what I expect down the road, I think probably two fates. One would be the absolute presidency where Erdogan will continue also with the help of the great surge to consolidate his power within the country. And if I'm right about this, in the last couple of years will look very democratic and liberal compared to what's coming. That's one scenario. The second scenario is uh, where Erdogan pushes harder to consolidate his power, but fails. So under those circumstances, I would imagine we will see more and more instability, especially in the streets. And one thing I think that should be highlighted is a chief advisor to the president, and he's been saying this for a couple of days now, uh, has suggested that uh, it would, the government should or would or will make it easier for the civilians to get to get arms. Uh, so that, and if, when another quit time comes along, the people will be armed to fight back. I think suggestions like those also are bad news for the future. Because, I mean, the last thing we would want in the streets would be people with lots of guns and not getting along. So Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Barack. Uh, so I just, before I ask Aaron one more question, there's this, uh, there's this Q&A app, um, and so people 
can ask these questions. If you're watching live right now, you can ask these questions on the side, and I'm going to start asking some of them. So the first one I'm going to throw out there is, um, this is uh, by Andrew Horde. Some of my Alevi friends are concerned about purges and attacks on them. Do you think this is a strong possibility? Um, maybe, uh, Salim, do you want to talk about this? Maybe you can also explain, especially to our American viewers, what, what the Alevi are and, uh, and the sort of, uh, I wouldn't say troubled history, but contentious history there. Sure. The, the Alevi are a, a religious minority in Turkey. Um, they, are, they make up about 10, 15% of Turkey's population. Um, and there is a history. I mean, they've, they've been a minority for, for quite some time in Turkey uh, since the time of the Ottoman Empire. And there is a history of uh, the government sort of cracking down on them, suppressing them. And uh, the Alevi were, they, they, they took on the values of the Republic very quickly. They're, they're fairly secular minded today. And um, they are, within the bureaucracy, they're, they're heavily in the judiciary, um, uh, lots of them in the private sector and in various roles, health as well. The, the thing is, um, I think there's a lot of fear today in Turkey post-coup because there's a lot of disorder still. I mean, I'm, I'm still, it's been, it's been two days, this is the third day, I'm still trying to wrap my head around things, what actually happened, how it happened, and uh, I've, I've been talking to, been talking to people who were at the AK Party headquarters and who, people who actually fought off the coup at MIT, um, people who were, were an Alibi friend who, for example, um, was thinking of going outside, but then he heard uh, shouts from mosques, and automatically he says he was he was very scared scared because there's a there's a history in this country of uh, the majority Sunni persecuting Alevis. So he was very scared. He stayed in even though he was angry about the coup and he wanted to go out. Um, so there are those things, and the 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 so-called purge that's going on. Yes, there, there are very uh, big, very broad lists now of of people who are people in the bureaucracy, um, which is a scary thing. But at the same time, I think it's important to realize that there isn't a viable alternative to that. This this movement mobilized a part of the military and actually tried to take over the country. And I think people people are now talking about what Taip Erdogan wants, how he's going to use this for regime change and things like that. And I've talked about that too. I mean, that's what you think about automatically. But um, you still have to think about, for example, last night he was supposed to come. He was supposed to come to Ankara. And uh, he didn't because the security situation was still unclear. Some of the people who work with him on a day-to-day -day basis, who were supposed to tell him about the coup, who were supposed to tell him about people calling in and saying that, you know, there were reports of a coup, um, didn't tell him. So there's, there's um, people are now afraid that the people who work with him on a daily basis were part of the Gulenist network. So they've arrested, I think, four people who work around him. Um, and those lists are, are going to be very broad because the Gulenis movement has been putting people into uh, the state, into uh, various arms of the state now for, you know, since the 70s almost. Um, that's, that's a very long time. Uh, you know, you, you, can, you can have very senior people in the military who, uh, in Islam it's called taqiyya, who uh, sort of uh, pretend to be uh, not religious. So they, they would drink, they would, you know, they would do all these non-Islamic things, uh, but secretly they would have allegiance to uh, Fethullah I mean, I know that, that the, the Gulen thing is still not proven entirely, but there's very little doubt around these circles um, that it was him. So, well, well his network rather than him. Um, so, that is a very big thing. 
So to counter that very, I mean, to, to counter that very big shock, the government is now um, engaging in this, this very wide sweep. Um, and that's bound to be scary. At the same time, there isn't really a viable alternative to that very big sweep. I think that the test of, you know, due process, are these people, you know, is this going to be witch hunt or, or are these people actually going to get a chance to, uh, you know, state their case? I think that is, the test of that is still to come. I think uh, the lists themselves, by themselves, I don't think are enough to condemn the government with, you know, purging all of its enemies. I don't think that's not likely or that, that that's not possible. Um, but I think it's still early for that. All right, thanks, Salim. I know Joshua has to step out in a minute. I just wanted to give him a quick word before he uh, before he departs, and then we'll, the rest of us will keep chatting. Joshua? Yeah, I apologize for having to leave. There's all sorts of things going on in the world, but I just want to thank you, Ryan, and also all my panelists and the people watching this. I think it's been really hard to, to cover and understand what's happening. Aaron also alluded to at the beginning that being in uh, Ankara like Salim is is incredibly uh, useful, but also sometimes having a perspective of taking a step back and watching it. And, and the fact that this is beyond a postmodern coup, in other words, a lot of what uh, caused the reactions on the ground was happening in the digital space. So the initial reports coming in of airplanes over Ankara, the bridges being closed, all the way in which Twitter and everything else was used, the irony of a president that has preached and also s said horrible things about social media. Uh, in some ways, his presidency, his government was saved by those very same tools. Uh, there's so many uh, paradoxes about uh, what happened on Friday. We'll be living with this for at least our lifetime for a while. It's not going away anytime soon. And, and the question is, how do we kind of make sense of it? So I just want to thank uh, Ryan and War on the Rocks. All of us are contributors. We continue to, to try to put War on the Rocks as the main area there. Uh, so thank you guys for, for tuning in. I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys have to say after this. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, Aaron, I want to turn to you. Um, there's a question from Joshua Brooks. It's, uh, if things unravel the way many think after the attempted coup with Erdogan further consolidating power, will Turkey's NATO membership be at risk? Yeah, I'll, I'll address, I want to pick up on something Salim said because it, 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 it links to this. Is the government is putting out a narrative that it's in complete control for very obvious reasons. You know, it needs to demonstrate that its authority and that it's consolidated sort of the you know, the, the the unitary uh, ability to to, to 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 carry out the use of force. I would challenge that. You know, and again, I'm not in Ankara and I'm not in Istanbul, but just talking with everybody I know and all of my friends there, there's still a much considerable uncertainty inside Turkey. Uh, there are the equivalent. I don't want to call it m mobs, but there are a considerable amount of people who are being encouraged to stay out in the streets. And then tangentially to that, you have seen some um, uh, aspects of sort of what you would expect. You know, violence being perpetrated against people. Uh, uh, there has been some 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 incidences uh, incidents with the levies. Um, um, there's been some of attacks on, say, HPP offices. But I, I would say for now, they've been relatively contained and small. And you know, you hate to say somewhat understandable, but somewhat understandable given what the country lived through uh, uh, from Friday to Saturday. Uh, and I think that 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 extends up into the president's office. I mean, let's not forget that 48 hours ago, his plane, according to Reuters, was put under lock by rogue F-16s. And, and you know, as Salim said, he's not able to return to the capital of the country. You know, this is not a country that has, 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 has fully picked up the pieces from what's going on, so it goes back to my original statements. You know, the portrayal of this is some sort of bungling, dim-witted, ill-conceived, stupid coup is wrong. I mean, they may have been all of that, but it was nevertheless relatively sophisticated, and, and again, I, I think far closer to success than anybody wants to sort of admit publicly. Uh, most of all, the Turkish government, again, for obvious reasons. Uh, and I think this ties into the Injurlik aspect. So when they closed Injurlik, everybody immediately said, oh, it's because they want to put pressure on the United States for Fethullah Gülen. Uh, and I admit my headspace went there too. But when you sort of stop to think about it, it's they probably closed Injurlik Air Force Base because they closed all of the airspace. Because military flights, and they couldn't trust the military 24 hours to 48 hours after this thing went down, because again, we're talking about at least 
eight fixed wing aircraft, you know, and an unknown number of helicopters were a part of this. You know, and so if you're sitting in Ankara and you're responsible for or Ankara or Istanbul, and you're responsible for presidential security, you shut the airspace down just like we did after 9/11. You don't know who's coming from where. Uh, uh, and I, I also say, and so this then gets to the broader NATO issue. You know, are these purges? Look, the purges have been very extensive. You know, this is where I slightly disagree with with with, with Salim. I mean, I think that they're the purges within the military and the police forces, again, given what's going on, makes makes sense. Cast a wide net, you know, and and then whether due process uh, plays out is again uh, up to the the, the 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 rule of law. What gives me question is the judges, and again, there's a lot that that's probably where Fatula Gelen has the most. Um, most reach into the Turkish bureaucracy, you know, at least nobody quite knows, but that's that's the, that's the expectation. That seemed opportunistic, and so that raises questions about will this become more opportunistic and actually threat driven, uh, and so that remains an open question. Uh, I actually think, and then building back into the NATO thing, is Secretary Kerry on our side has actually handled it quite well. Uh, it's to be expected that they're going to play with the Gulen issue. Um, I happen to be in the minority that think they don't really want to extradite him. They just want to keep him here. You know, if they really want to extradite him, they should fill out the paperwork and go through all the all the processes needed to do it. Uh, but they haven't done that yet. And so uh, I think it's good uh, that Kerry came out and said that first. But we shouldn't play with the NATO membership issue. I mean, there's a lot of talk in this town about kicking Turkey out of NATO. I mean, I think that's just a silly policy proposal that has no relevance and has no real salience. Turkey is a difficult NATO ally. It's always been a difficult NATO ally. Erdogan is a particularly difficult ally for the United States, but nevertheless, Turkey is what it is. Injurlik remains important for all sorts of things, and we sort of have to figure it out. And I think Kerry's been doing a decent job. Oh, sorry, I was muted there. Thanks so much. Uh, Burke, do you want to respond to any of that? Anything so what Salim said or what Aaron said? Uh, I think I can speak to one burning item out there, which is something I also put down for the piece that I wrote for War on the Rocks today. Uh, I think the question so far, the puzzle is the extent of Gulen movements involvement in all of this. And this is a you know $64,000 question, probably worth I mean, more than that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. Like It makes perfect sense to me why Erdogan almost instantly would blame Gulen as the you know, as a person behind all of this, but it makes much less to me, much less sense to me, uh, how and why and in which ways, Yulen is behind all of this. I'm not saying it is impossible, but I'm not sure about the extent to which Yulen has gone to make this happen. And I think there are a few reasons for me to ask for further evidence to be convinced. The first is now uh, one can possibly say that Gulen has been infiltrating state apparatus for decades now. That I think is true. And how he operates is not through conversion, so he doesn't have usually, at least from what we know, uh, going back to Aaron's suggestion, yeah. I mean, anything you say about Gulen movement is just, can be taken as too subjective, no matter what you say. We just don't know what they are, their true nature. Now, but from what we know, at least what we think we know, the way they infiltrate is not through conversion by approaching, say, mature members. They try to insert sleep regions from very early on and let them sleep for a long time until you know, they're required for activation. Now, if you think in those terms, the high time for Gulen movements infiltration uh, is basically the last 10, 12, 13 years when Gulen struck an alliance with Erdogan. Uh, so, and we know that during the postmodern coup of 1997, the military literally gutted, literally gutted anyone and everyone uh, that it's perceived as quasi-religious. So I think it is. It seems very unlikely for me, uh, to me, that there will be thousands of, or ha even hundreds of, Gulen sleeper agents in the army that's been sleeping for decades now. Again, it, it, it's a long time and military gutted almost everyone that it deemed not only Gulen supporters, somewhat religious in late 90s. And second reason is, and we're talking about thousands of military officers, and again, if we look back a little further, 
a little, you know, into the near past, we, we were talking about Argonicon and Balios trials, which are sort of controversial. And even uh, President Erdogan accepted their controversial with respect to the evidence they presented. And during those trials, you know, hundreds and thousands of military officers have been literally put on trials. And again, some of those trials were based on controversial evidence. So the military officers in general do not have a lot of you know, sympathy for Gilan. And I just tried to highlight it in my piece today. I mean, who do seculars, including, you know, secular military officers or military folks hate or just dislike more? I mean, I don't know. Uh, there's no love for Gulen in, in Turkey, especially among the secular folks. So all these combined, it seems sort of uh, not impossible, uh, but in need of further evidence and argument for us to be convinced that Gulen was able to orchestrate all of this. So this is where I think we should be talking and thinking about before jumping into conclusions. Thanks, Barack. I, just to tie a few things together, I mean, the, one of the funny, I guess, things about the Gulen movement is if you look at what the what people when people want to criticize the Gulen movement in the United States, there's these dark conspiracies about them being Islamists. And when you see criticisms in the Turkish press about the Gulen movement, they're called Zionists and homosexuals and terrorists. So it's just this very different sort of view, a negative view on each side of the ocean. There's sort of this cipher. It's sort of like a you see what you want when you look at the Gulen movement, but just to just to take a more historical view, uh, and then we'll get into final final remarks because people have to get back to their back to their days. Um, but you know, this is the first coup that was that uh, that this of the, certainly anything of this of this scale that was executed without uh, without the top level buy-in of the military since I think 1960. Um, and uh, what. It's going to be interesting to know, or to even find out, if we're ever going to get the full story on what exactly happened, who were the driving plotters behind it, uh, how it was organized, why they chose to act when they did, if they actually did want to wait longer, and if that explains the poor execution of the operation. But given the way Turkey is going and the way that they're you know, treating information and, and, uh, and, and the way Erdogan's cracking down on the opposition press, including press from opposition groups that condemned the coup and stuck with the government, uh, I think it's unlikely that we'll find out what actually happened for quite a while. And I just wanted to get closing remarks from you guys on about a minute each if you do think we'll ever find out what happened and uh, what you think we should be watching for in the coming days. Uh, what do you want to go? I guess I'll go, go first. Um, just, yeah, a lot of it rests on how much Gulen involvement was there. And, and, and it goes to your sort of final remarks here. We have absolutely no idea. You know, and, and, and that is the million dollar question is who was really involved in this because I agree with both Sadim and Barak's uh, sort of analysis on, 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 on the subject. Will we know exactly what happened and when? Uh, I, I know. I, I, I think eventually we'll, we'll get a general sense of what's going on. Um, I mean, I think just now as we're on the phone, you know, Al Jazeera Turk put out a transcript of what they say was the WhatsApp group. And that's how they were communicating to coordinate this. They had a transcript, and there was WhatsApp, and so you, you could probably begin to. Piece Eric, up. just to interrupt. Aaron and I also conspire on WhatsApp, so we do. We do. We do. We're making use of WhatsApp, and uh, I think a lot of us are moving over there um, um, because we enjoy the encryption, um, especially if we're concerned foreign governments watch what we tweet. Um, we um, so we can learn a little bit more about how the execution went down. Um, but in terms of the nuts and bolts, you know, how does a group of officers within the Turkish military Get, gather enough support again to get six F-16s, ordnance, helicopters, arm them, and you know, including special op, uh, special ops forces to 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 to, uh, to repel into a, a a a hotel down in Marmaris. Uh, how does that all functionally work? I don't think we'll ever know the answers to that. And I think that will get lost in the how much Gulen involvement was there, how does the Gulen movement actually operate, because I think the tactical execution point of this points to what the military will be looking at itself moving forward. And I think the broader point, and this is something that may sound controversial, is I think this, this, this is unprecedented in that, whereas the other coups were unfortunate, the military, quote-unquote, won, and so you emerge with a cohesive force on the other side, whatever you think of the coup. 
Well, they didn't win this time, the Kuists, and you end up on the other side with a broken force and a fractured force. And I think that is the longer term implication to this. How will this, including all of the subsequent arrests that will be made, affect the cohesiveness and coherency of Turkish institutions across the board, with the military being the one that we're going to focus on? And also, just, you know, this is a massive turning point in civil military relations in Turkey. A friend of mine, Turkish friend of mine, just arrived back in Istanbul, was out of the country by happenstance during the, the coup attempt, arrived back in Istanbul, was leaving the airport, and found a uh, mannequin dressed as a Turkish soldier hanged in effigy with a cheering crowd beneath it, which really just would have been unimaginable in Turkey. L let me just address that really quickly, because I'd like to hear Selim's thoughts before we sign off. I think we're also getting to another inflection point. So whereas the first wave were, let's let's call them the far right, you know, sort of the, the religious conservative, some Islamist, some far right, sort of gray wolf, uh, the, the nationalists. Turks are, are very proud people. Um, and you know, despite all this, they still hold the army in high, high esteem, especially on what we would call the left, even though they're not really left. How long can this continue where the army is beaten down you know, by sort of people in the streets before it elicits another turning point in this? And that's another question I have, because you know, I think we're getting to another inflection point where people are going to get sick and tired of what you just said, mannequins held up in, 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 in officers' uniforms being... Uh, you know, s simulating uh, lynching. Thank, thank you, Aaron. Salim, I'm going to turn to you, and then I'm going to give Barack the last word. All right. Um, I think Aaron touched on some very interesting points there. I think this is also uh, military first, but uh, a question of state capacity across the board, across all of Turkey's institutions. I mean, the first institution actually uh, that the Gulen started seeping into. Uh, was education. They they became teachers. Um, if you were in the late seventies, if you if you graduated from a good enough school and you got a good score, you know you, you got you got a good enough score to go to med school. But they would tell you no, no, uh, go become a teacher. And people would because you know they they believe in the movement. So how many of Turkish teachers now are Gulenists? That it, it used to be sort of a uh, a sort of awkward. An uncomfortable question. Now it's a very serious question of security. Um, so the state, at some point, is going to have to deal with that. The, the the lists now that are being compiled are about judiciary, police, you know, the vital organs. Uh, but there are, you know, central bank, other places where, uh, especially sort of places where you need high degree of education, uh, are sort of were at some point Gulen strongholds, now much less so because there already have been purges, but uh, those places will probably be revisited. I guess about the coup and uh, the coup attempt, rather, and, and how, to what extent Gulen were involved, I think, I mean, so to things, I guess I have a little personal anecdote about that. I, you know, I'm a think tanker, I'm supposed to establish connections across the bureaucracy here. One of the people I was talking to was uh, was a guy known on Twitter as Annelies Halbe, and this guy, um, yeah, um, this guy, he, when he came to Ankara, I actually met him personally. Um, he he was a smart guy, I and mean, he is a smart guy, I guess. Um, tweeted mostly about the PKK and stuff like that, and um, me and some friends of ours, we 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 thought, you know, there might be some Gulenist strain to him, but um, we really didn't take it seriously. We thought, okay, you know, whatever, he might be good at us, he might not. You do that a lot in Ankara. You, you, you meet some bureaucrat and then you're like, oh, is he or is he not? And then you put that question aside and you keep talking to him. Well, this guy um, was a coup plotter. Uh, and he was, he was not low ranking. He, he was high up there. And uh, when they tried to arrest him, he actually shot at the police. You know, um, how do we just to push back real quick? How do we know that he was a coup plotter and the government isn't isn't just saying he's a coup plotter? I really have nothing. I know I have no idea about this guy, but how do we know this? Well, he actually tweeted. Uh, he actually tweeted things suggesting that he was. Uh, when the coup started, he uh, he tweeted something uh, like, "Oh, what's happening?" and then a little smiley face or something like that. He was being sarcastic about it. Uh, he's, you know, 
joking about it. And uh, and then when the coup started going south, he said something like, "Oh, I, I have no idea what's going on." No, no. Actually, before that, uh, somebody somebody asked him what was going on, and he said uh, on Twitter something like, "Oh, I've become a, a, a commander, so don't mess with me." And um, and then when the, once the coup started going south, he tweeted something like, and he deleted his previous tweet, tweeted something like, "I've been stuck in traffic all day." And of course, they they haven't found him. They didn't find him in traffic. They they found him um, holed up somewhere sure. with a gun. Sorry, it, it was a perfect picture because I think he was almost shirtless. Yeah, yeah, he he had a sort of a wife beater on. Yeah, um, and uh, and he shot at the police as they came to came for him. So I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that he was <laughs> he was in on the coup. Okay. So and well, and my feeling about him was that, I mean, as I said, that he might have been a villainist and just the sort of the form, the way he moved, the way he. He talked to people the way he uh, his the the younger people around him looked up to him. Uh, you sort of have a feeling for for Gulenis, and I'm sure you meet them in the states too. It's it's a certain kind of uh, mold. But yeah, that's that's my two cents. We'll we'll see, I guess, how how the whole thing unfolds. All right, Barack, I'll give you the closing word. Good, thank you. So, uh, five quick comments. First, a historical corrective to the conventional narrative. I think right after the coup of 1960, which could be called a colonel's coup, uh, there were two coup attempts by the Palat Aydemir, early 60s, and both of them failed, and the second time he was hanged. So I think uh, maybe we should go back to the early 60s to learn lessons from civil military relations. Of course, things are different, but I think that there is a correction that we need to remind ourselves. Uh, second, and reflecting on what Aaron suggested, I think the coup plotters did a sort of decent job of planning this at the military level. But I think what I found lacking was there is not much of a political strategy. I mean, to have a successful coup in Turkey, you need to have some sort of popular backing, and the coup plotters did very, very poorly in that you know, area. So I think that's something sort of that brought down the, the coup attempt. And a third item that I would just highlight is, now, we're talking about in, in specific terms, thousands of military officers being detained as, and the military being gutted, I think this will have a long-term impact on, again, cohesion and effectiveness of the Turkish military you know, forces. Because we're talking about thousands of, potentially thousands of military officers being taken out of the system, which will leave the Turkish military, as far as security and power projection and concentrations are concerned, very, very weak and sort of uh, vulnerable. A fourth item would be, I think, now we have blood on the streets. There is, there is not something typical to Turkish coup attempts or Turkish coups in the past. Now we have lots of coup plotters being killed. We have lots of conscripts being sort of, you know, uh, basically brutalized or killed. We have lots of protesters, peaceful protesters, overrun by tanks in the streets of Istanbul. Now we're talking about lots of, you know, blood. And this, I will suggest, will have long-term impacts on the divisions, schisms already robust in the country. And final item is, when the, the last and postmodern coup happened in 1997, uh, the generals of the coup sort of uh, suggested that the process they began, they started, would last a thousand years. So these were their actual words. And this, I think, should just suggest something about the slipperiness of the Turkish political domain. Uh, we should expect unexpected and we should expect or we should, we should not think things will stay as they are because we're talking about even today, and it's only been three days, even after three days, we're talking about a very slippery ground. So in Turkey, things are complicated first, as all, everyone knows. Second, they tend to change a lot. Three years ago, we would not be talking about Bilan movement there was something that we know of, but we never talk about, we never spoke of uh, out in the detail. Now we're talking about uh, Erdogan asking for extradition of Bilan from the United States. So what I would urge uh, our listeners would be to think more creatively and in a more open-minded fashion about what may happen, what, what may happen next in Turkish politics.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Barack, and thanks for the thanks to the guests for coming on. This was arranged very last minute. Uh, you know, it's been really great to at Warner Rocks to something big happens in Turkey and have so many talented people to reach out to and call upon. So thanks, guys, and uh, read Barack's article today at Warren the Rocks and read Salim's article from over the weekend at Warren the Rocks. Bill Park had a great piece. Aaron's going to write something great for us, and we have more coming out uh, from a few other people uh, later this week. So thanks for joining me, guys, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.